100%. As I said at Donna's funeral on Thursday, your prayers work wherever they are. And will you keep praying, as I know you are, that God will work in this group and in this congregation for His glory and for our world's good. So let me just pray to conclude us. Lord, hear our cries answer our prayers, and do bigger and bolder and better things than we can even imagine. You're a good God. And Lord, may that be known by us today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. I want to share with us for about 13 minutes on this prayer that I think just fits for us today. So Ephesians chapter 3 is where we're going to be. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14 It is a prayer by Paul that we have referenced a few times since I've been here. It's a prayer that we have prayed a few times since I've been here, but it's a prayer that we've never unpacked. And so Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, it's going to be on the screen as you were flipping there. It says this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge." that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This morning I want us to unpack those seven verses. Verse 14 starts with, for this reason. And it's actually the second time in this chapter that Paul says that. For this reason. He starts off chapter 3, for this reason. And then he gets sidetracked in in verses 2 through 13 where he he gets off because his his mind is going somewhere else where he wants to say, let me explain all that has just happened. And so he spends about 12 verses in just like a a sidetracked moment. And then he comes back in verse 14 and he says, for this reason, it it harkens back to chapter 2 of Ephesians. Chapter 2 of Ephesians tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, having no hope without God. And then it tells us in verse 4, But God, rich in mercy, because of His great love for us, even when we were dead, He sent His Son so that we may live. He says it twice in the first ten verses, For it is by grace you have been saved. And so Paul is so enamored by what has happened in Ephesians chapter 2 that by grace, nothing that I've done, nothing that I can accomplish, no work that I can do has saved me, but only the work of God because of His great mercy has saved me. Paul also tells us that now not only do the Jews have access to this, but the Gentiles are included and have access to the same Father. And Paul just says, for this reason, I bow my knee. I am so overwhelmed and overcome by the grace and mercy and love of God that for this reason I bow my knee. And that's a a change from the typical posture of prayer for Paul in his day. Typically you would stand and pray, but Paul gets down on his knees, he says, and I am praying this over you. This this idea of getting on our knees, that's a, a common thought in Christian world now. I don't know how often it's a practice. But we talk about, oh, well, we were on our knees praying. Have you ever tried it? Is that a constant in your prayer life? Because for the season of my life that I have done it, it has changed my prayers and really given me a focus and and a humble spirit before God. Paul says, I am bowing my knee. It's the same posture that Solomon, when he dedicates the temple to God, does. It's the same posture when Stephen, as he is getting stoned, gets into. It's the same posture as Jesus, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, not my will but yours be done. He gets on his knee, and so Paul gets on his knee And he begins to pray. He prays to the Father, verse 15, from whom every family and nation comes from. God is the Almighty Father, the Father of Jesus, the Father of all people. And He knows not only their name, but He knows who they are. That's what a father does. And a father cares for the good of his sons and daughters. 
So Paul has opened up verses 14 and 15 as prayer. Verse 16, we get to the meat of it. That according to the riches of His glory. Paul doesn't say out of the riches of His glory. Because then there's some finite box which Paul has to mean, which God is reaching into to give this out to us. No, according to the riches of His glory. Paul, Paul is saying that God gives to us these riches from who He is. It is a limitless spring of who He is. It's not a limited in any way or finite or uh, controlled in any way. God gives from who He is that He may grant you strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, being rooted and grounded in love. Paul is praying for strength for the church of Ephesus that he knows comes from the Holy Spirit. He is praying over the people as they are trying to live out for God. He is praying that you will have strength. And he doesn't answer it immediately. Could that be strength to love, strength to persevere, strength to carry on, strength to fight, strength to continue, strength to know? He kind of leaves it open at this point where we just need strength. Strengthen my patience. Strengthen my love, strengthen my care, strengthen my compassion, strengthen my, my fervor, my zeal. Will you be strengthened with the power that is in you that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith? I love how he says that you're rooted and grounded in love. You're not swayed and shaken or changed. You're established. You're anchored. You are stuck in this. He says, I want you to be Grounded in this love. In verse 18, they, that they may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge and that you'll be filled with all the fullness of God. He's praying for them to have strength to comprehend the vastness of who God is. The length, the width, the height, the depth, the breadth, how awesome and amazing and how big and awesome and like unfathomable God is, that you may understand that and know that love. He wants the church of Ephesus to know God as he knows God in a deep way, a full way, a way that changes everything. And so Paul writes what seems like an oxymoron. He says in verse uh, 19, Ron's going to throw that on the screen for us, I, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Is Paul going mad here? How do you know something that surpasses knowledge? That, that seems unfathomable, doesn't it? I mean, like, I, I spent a lot of time in my math education days uh, proving proofs. And you could know beyond a shadow about this will happen. Pythagoras was right. But how do we know something that surpasses knowledge? It's like saying, will you see what cannot be seen? Will you describe to me the flavor of water? Will you explain to me the sound of silence? How do we know what surpasses knowledge? What Paul is showing us here is that this love of God that he is talking about, the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, isn't an intellectual only exercise. God is not only found in textbook definitions and theological papers. No, to know the love of God is more than just a knowledge in your head. It brings about experiencing God. To know Him is to feel and experience and, and to see Him at work. Paul desires that they have a knowing that surpasses knowledge. See, there's a lot of scholars of the historical Jesus that know more facts about Jesus than you and I do. They could tell you things and places that you and I would have no clue what that even means. But the problem is some of them only know the historical Jesus, not the Savior Jesus. And there's a huge difference. We need to know that experiential understanding, not that we can explain away and prove how the cross pays for my sin through substitutionary atonement. No, I want to know that deep down inside, I go to bed with peace at night because Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. 
That is experienced. And then he says that you'll be strengthened by the Spirit, rooted in love, comprehend the vastness of God, that you will know the love of Christ. And then he says, and that you'll be filled with the fullness of God. The simplest way to understand this is becoming what God desires you to be, that you become spiritually mature. And as I consider that prayer, 16 through 19 especially, I realize that is my desire for this church. That we may be strengthened by the Spirit to know how God urges and pushes and calls us. That that we may be rooted and grounded in love, for without love we're just merely clanging cymbals, making noises, as 1 Corinthians 13 tells us. Nothing else matters if we're not in love, we don't have love. That we will comprehend the vastness of God. His height and depth and breadth and width. That we will have a bigger and bigger expanding view of who our God is. That we don't try to box in the Almighty. That that we don't try to make finite the infinite God. No, that we will understand that. And that we will experience the love of Christ. See, too many of us know about God, but I want to make sure that you know God. That you know Him and know how much He loves you and desires you. Too many of us can say the right words, can paraphrase enough verses to think we can get by. Too many of us can answer a lot of Bible trivia questions. But do you know God personally and intimately? Do you abide with Him or do you simply associate around Him? And I pray that we'll be filled with the fullness of God. That we'll become spiritually mature. Paul ends his sermon this way, or his prayer this way. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can think or ask, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. One commentator about verse 20 says this, Nowhere has ever been recorded a bolder request. Nowhere. In light of the greatness of Paul's petition that God will work in amazing ways, he then says, but God, you can do far more than I could ever think, ask, imagine. You can do more than anything that I can conceptualize. Paul is praying for God to do more than his finite mind can fathom. Why? Because Paul knows about the height and the depth and the width and the breadth and the length of God's love. He knows that God is bigger than what he can put in a box. So, Will you join me in praying that? God, work beyond what we think is possible. Do more, do bigger, do greater, do grander things than we even can conceptualize here. I said a few months back, God has a bigger vision for our church than anybody in this room does. God's got a bigger vision. You say you want this city to all experience and come to Christ? He says, I want the whole state. You say, I want the the country. He says, I want the whole world. Listen, God desires more, and He loves people bigger and better and more than we can ever understand. And He says in verse 21, how is this going to be experienced? To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. The church has a place in the plan of God. We play a purpose As an instrument of salvation to a dying world, we are called to be used for God's glory. So as we ventured forward, we are believing in this type of God. We are praying to this God. We are trusting in this God. We are following this God that can do more than we can think or ask. As we launch out next Sunday, We will be a church that follows the God that can do more than we can ask, think, or imagine. We are trusting that His ways are higher and better and bigger than what we could ever conceive. And we believe that we play a part that God desires to use this church and this community for His glory. That this local congregation is a part of His global plan. And we want to play our part. So today we pray for strength and power and faith 
and knowledge and experiencing of his love for fullness that we will be mature. And all of this is only what God can supply. And we seek to keep pace with this infinite God who has infinite love and pours out his infinite grace to those who believe. Let me pray as we close and Kelly's going to uh, lead us in a song. It may be new to you, but it's a great one. We've talked about building up this church on the foundation of who God is. And today's song, as we conclude in this section, is I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. That is what we are going to be rooted and grounded in. So let me pray and let us sing. Dear God, I I pray now that the heart of that prayer from Ephesians 3 will be experienced in Farmer's Branch. That we may know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. That we will be strengthened with the power from the Spirit in our inward being. That we will, will be filled with the fullness of God. And so, Lord, work in our hearts. Work through our church and work all around in our community so that the people of this area experience your love and your grace. Lord, we love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen.